Welcome everybody. This is the community meeting for OpenFGA for August 2023. Kind of as we started, I think we in, in April, right? So this is number five, I think. So uh, welcome to the new people that haven't joined the previous ones. I think uh, that's only you, Gabriel. The rest of the people, I think they joined us before too. And the, so in general, we start with a few introductions in the, about who is, who is in the call, and uh, then mention the things we recently, what are we working on, and, uh, and then what's next, and then open to Q&A. If you have any question at any moment that you want uh, that is important to you, feel free to kind of uh, interrupt, right, and, and, and ask, and uh, we have some time for Q&A at the end, hopefully. So uh, this is the team, and uh, now we are having for for a for a few uh, months we are going to have Daniel and Justin helping out uh, doing some work on, on developer tools. Uh, Justin haven't joined yet. Hopefully he will join in a few minutes. Uh, he needs to to demo the Java SDK, so and, and hopefully he can he can participate. And uh, so this is us, and uh, I. I don't know. I think that the the rest of the people in in the meeting we, we already talked to them. Maybe Gabriel, you are the only person we we we, we yeah, is the first one here. Maybe you want to give you a little introduction about what you do and what you're looking forward to to achieve with OpenFCA. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I don't want to disappoint, but uh, I was searching for something to contribute, basically that involves GoLang and on CNCF uh, projects around. So then I found FGA, it was a no, uh, new project and I saw have few contributors. So I, I imagine that I have more space to contribute. About myself, uh, I'm a software engineer. Previously, I was working on Calyptia around uh, Fluent Beat, Fluent D, uh, always working around tools, around Kubernetes, like operators, creating plugins, CLIs, etc. So when I saw OpenFGA as a new project, I saw I have a lot of space to improve. So then I jump in. Basically awesome. This. Great news. Yeah. Perfect. And that, that sounds great. So we, we I already have a few ideas where you can help. Now, in, in, like a, so we can maybe discuss that at some moment. And, uh, and that, that, that sounds great. Okay, perfect. So let, let's go to where, we, I don't know if any of you want to say hi. Like I don't know, Jacob, Pranaya, uh, Pranaya Peter, Johnny. Hello, good morning. Good to see you all again. Perfect. Okay, so let, let's go where we've been doing. So in the uh, the last month, these are things we've been working the last month. Like, uh, so we released a new version of uh, OpenFGA. Uh, I think the, the main thing was like, uh, maybe Jonathan can explain that a little more whenever we get to uh, the, the OpenFGA demo thing. And uh, But uh, this is a breaking change mostly for people that were using our uh, OpenFGA as a library, which I know your team was doing that, Jacob, and maybe other people were doing that. I don't know, Jacob, if you ended, if you were able to migrate to, to the new version or not, and, the, and it would just, was that painful? Yeah, we're, so we're actually, we're a little bit behind right now. We just finished the 1.2 upgrade, um, hoping to get 1.3 next week or the week after. Um, but Somewhat recent, I guess maybe a few months ago, we actually switched from the a library integration to kind of a a more just standard fork. Um, so okay. we, we just kind of we merge in the changes and and uh, like kind of all at once and, and don't okay. have a library build now. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, and the, I think if you are relying on the buff remote generated packages, you might have issues even with one one with your forking one two. Right. That, that's my understanding. Yeah, but, uh, yeah I think yeah. Like, uh, when we did upgrade to version 1.2.0, like I'm still seeing some build failures uh, with this, like that related to buff uh, packages. So um, we're planning to do a upgrade to version 1.3.0 soon. Okay. Perfect. Great. So if you're, um, I, I'll just mention if you're using like a like a package cache or package proxy of some form like artifactory or you know jfrog something like that 
it probably won't impact you as much as it will impact others. Um, but yeah, we we had to we had a developer moment. So apologies for the for the breaking change. Um, we thought we understood the impact of a deprecation notice from Buff. Buff is the tool that we use to manage our uh, building our proto buff uh, proto buff sources, and uh, they ended up deprecating one of their yeah one of their uh, I guess domains, if you will, where they're serving Go generated sources from. So that impacted all of our builds. Okay. So in general, this wouldn't be a problem for you if you are not building OpenFGA yourself or not using a library. If you're using it just as a server, you won't have any impact. But uh, for some use cases, it was, it was impactful. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, then we shipped a new beta of the CLI. And the, this one has support for and parsing and, and writing using the DSL format. We are not going to demo it because we demoed the last time, but I'm just going to cover it in some slides. Uh, Daniel was working on a VS Code extension. He's going to demo that. As I, I love to get proper syntax coloring in VS Code, and then that will also get better. And we also released them because we're going to use it in different places. One is the Visual Studio Code extension, uh, a grammar that we define in, in NTLR with bindings to Go and JavaScript. But the idea is that we're going to use that as a as a new core grammar for everything. And, uh, and we plan to have bindings to other languages and use it in the, in the VS Code integration in the server integration in the future. So it will be like our standard uh, language definition that, that may be useful for you if you are building some tooling on top of, of that yourself. So where we're working now, so we keep working in the CLI we, and, and we, we uh, and in, the, in, the last person, in the last meeting, we showed the, the few things that we had are in the roadmap. I'm gonna cover them to, um, today too. And that we're working in adding support for more, more ABAC scenarios. We have, we've been working in a design for that. And we actually, we know how to do it now. We have all the pieces together and all the trade-offs we need to make to implement it. And I think it's gonna, it's looking fine. Uh, we're working the Java SDK, the plugin, and we also implemented a simple caching implementation that Jonathan is going, is going to demo that is going to improve performance in some use cases for, for, for you. And next, we are going to work on adding more flexibility on how you can out implement the final authorization for who's calling the OpenFGA server and also in an SDK for, for the Rust language. There's always that link there in the that you can see this roadmap in, in GitHub if you're interested and provide feedback and ask questions if you want. So demos, uh, we are gonna start with Daniel because he's gonna uh, show us the, the Visual Studio Code extension he's been working on. And then, so I'm gonna stop sharing now and let uh, Daniel share. Thank you, Daniel. Cool, all right, sharing screen. Um, here we go. So uh, up and available right now, the, the first cut, uh, if you go to marketplace and search open FGA, you'll be able to find it. Sweet 29 downloads, uh, I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, but yeah, uh, that's how you jump in. Um, you'll also be able to find it in the, uh, the visual code extension panel, um, if that's preferred. Uh, and we currently offer uh, three core features with this first release. Uh, the first is uh, basic syntax highlighting. Um, uh, it was good to get this this out. It makes it much more readable. Uh, it comes if you want to uh, uh, use the official theme. You can go in here and set open FGA dark, uh, and uh, you get sorry sneak preview. You get um, uh, this a much more readable and uh, colorized version of the syntax. Um, that's quite informative uh, just in terms of reading. Um, and uh, finally, the other, uh, the other um, feature we've got working, uh, if I open up my command palette, uh, we can transform uh, DSL that's in the browser and generate a new JSON file out of it. Um, so uh, those th that's that's the big summary. Um, I'm pretty 
pretty happy with uh, how this has come out so far, but there's a lot of work left to go. Um, uh, and just as a very quick uh, sneak preview, I'm working on validation at this point. Um, uh, this is by no means final. It's it's a real mock up, but uh, I'd uh, love to to just demonstrate quickly like what what the validation experience might feel like once we're on the the antler grammar. Um, so just quickly, if I say uh, broke one of the uh, the type names that's used, if we uh, accidentally fat finger it. You'll see uh, that every reference to the type uh, reports an error, which I think is really cool. Um, uh, and same goes for uh, if we, you know, say broke a member, uh, but also it'll handle multiple uh, errors uh, in, all together. Um, so uh, you'll be able to get you know, the full list of everything that's broken uh, in your in your syntax, essentially. Uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, I'll return uh, control. Nice work. Thank you, thank you. You're muted, Andres. Yeah, it was anxious. Thank you for giving my control so I can change the slide and now I'll ask uh, Jonathan to share his screen and continue. All righty, sounds good to me. One second here. Let's see here, I've got them pulled up. Yeah, we're good. Share screen, number two. Cool, can you see my terminal? Okay, wonderful. So we've been working on um, adding some support to OpenFGA's core server uh, for caching what we kind of call sub problems. Uh, it's basically just caching the results of checks and intermediate checks that we make um, when we resolve uh, a given check query. So <clears throat> you could imagine the, the, the demo that I'm gonna give here is, imagine that you have a model that looks like this, just a you know standard kind of Google doc style model. And we have documents. Documents can have viewers. So if you if you have the document viewer relationship, or you're an editor, or you have viewer from the parent, then you can view the document. And it's possible that as you're as you're evaluating document viewership, you might evaluate the same relationships more than once. So let me so show you some tuples here. Let's say that there's a, a relationship tuple that gives um, the editor relationship to some engineering group. And that's on document one. That same document has a parent relationship, some folder, and that folder has a viewer that is also group ENG member. If we were to, to make a, a check of the form, you know, can, can user John view document one? In order to answer that question, we have to look up document editor and look up who's who's a member of that engineering group. And we have to look up folder viewer and look up who's a member of that engineering group. And so that kind of implies that there's some duplicate work there, right? There are two paths of evaluation in order to answer that check query. There are two paths of evaluation that require that that involve the same query, right? Is user John a member of the engineering group? And that's going to manifest itself two times in this query when resolving a single check. So the work that we've done is we've added uh, a, you know, check a, a cache to our check resolution. As we evaluate a check, we we cache sub problems that we've seen so that we are not recomputing those on any path of evaluation that uh, is visiting a relationship that we've already seen. And likewise, uh, the top level check that happens here, right? We also cache this outcome. So we're effectively caching check responses, check results, check queries, um, and avoiding going to the database. So that's what I wanted to show you here. Um, this work will be coming out in a very, you know, 
very soon release. Uh, but in this release, you'll be able to specify uh, the check query cache enabled flag and the check query cache experimental flag. So this will come out as an experimental feature at first, and then we'll kind of move it into an official feature after it's had a little bit of time to bake. Um, so you can enable that cache and there's, there's some default settings around this. So there, there's some other configs that you can set. Um, actually, let me just show you those really quick. If you do run dash H, there are settings that you can do around um, the query cache TTL. So how long we are, we will cache a, a, a check result and how large that cache can be. So you can use these to kind of tune how stale your checks are. Obviously, if you if you opt into this new check cache, then you're going to be trading off a little bit of consistency for latency. So your you know your checks are going to be faster if you have a cache hit, but they might be a little bit stale up to whatever your TTL is. So, anyways, we'll go ahead and run the server with the check cache enabled. Um, what I'm demoing is is pretty primitive. Again, we just have this model here, Google Doc style model. So we'll go ahead and we'll create that model. We're going to write some relationship tuples. So like I said, we're going to give an editor relationship to the engineering group for document one. And then document one has a parent relationship with a folder. And that folder has a viewer relationship with some engineering group. We'll go ahead and write those relationship tuples. And then we'll call check. We'll see, does user John have viewer on document one? In this case, the answer is no. User John's not part of the engineering group. And I did that on purpose just to demonstrate kind of what we're doing here. Um, if you're using our telemetry feature, all of our metrics, you can see how that server is running. We have this new metric called check cache total count and check cache hit count. So you can use this as a ratio to determine what your cache hit ratio is for check calls in OpenFGA. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll call that check. We get allowed as false, which is what we expect. And we hit this and those numbers changed. So what we see here is that the check took a total of five. We had to do five evaluations. Basically there were five paths in our check resolution tree that we had to evaluate to evaluate that check, but we have a cash hit somewhere along the way. And the reason for that is that <clears throat> as we're evaluating these relationship tuples, we come across the editor and that's related to group ENG member. And we come across folder viewer and that's related to group ENG member. But one of these paths is already, one of these paths, we already evaluated group ENG member. So we had a cache hit on group ENG member. It's not obvious, obviously just from the single numeric metric, but that's what's going on here is we are caching those sub problems. And then if we call cache, if we call check again, you can see that that increases there. And within that 10 second interval, we get more and more cache hits. So that's kind of what, we, what we've been working on for a hot minute. Um, yeah, hopefully this will improve check performance by quite a bit. And if you have models and relationship tuples that um, have a lot of relationships to the same you know, objects, then this should improve performance by an even more like drastic factor than just kind of what the simple demo demonstrated, uh, because every every relationship that you've already visited, you're not going to have to visit it again. You're going to have an answer for it. So super awesome performance improvement. Um, looking forward to seeing how it helps everyone's performance in the community. That's it. Thanks, John. So. Uh... Abel is asking in the chat if uh, yeah. is there any scenario where this will make things uh, slow or, or worse? Uh, well, I so my my initial thought would be no. Um, we are avoiding going to the database, which is going to help things a lot. The the only thing that I could think might impact it right is we're storing something in memory, so there is there are cache keys being evicted from the memory based on the total size and the TTL of that cache, which implies some, you know, heap, heap churning. There's some garbage collection that takes place there. So I suppose if you set a really, really large cache size and you're evicting items from your cache super frequently, you might start seeing a little bit of server process impact because of the overhead of the garbage collection of those cache keys. Um, Although I, I think the likelihood of that being 
that impactful is probably pretty low. Does that make sense, Abel? Um, okay, yeah. Uh, said about cash TTL, can I evict the cash manually? Cash can't be evicted manually right now. Yeah, no, it's it's um, in memory cache of the service itself. So if you want to set a tighter tolerance on the on the eviction policy, basically just set a lower TTL. Something we are we are discussing, we are going to have uh, hopefully soon is a way to let you specify when you're making a check if you want to use the cash or not, right? And uh, so in scenarios where you need strong strong reads, right, and uh, you can call check in a way that we guarantee go to the database and not using the cash. Right? But uh, so that's something that will be added to to both yeah, to the to the API to the check and then list of checks APIs. Okay, so now our next demo would be the Java SDK one. So, Justin, we go to you. All right, uh, let me get my screen shared. Uh, just a moment. Okay. Oh. Okay, um, so I will uh, I'll show off a uh, Java SDK that I've been working on. Um, it's functional, and then uh, work remaining on it, so it's kind of in preview. You can't use it yet, um, but it's functional, missing some authentication, some other stuff that's uh, in progress. Uh, so let me let me run a OpenFGA server. I'm just going to run it on you know default 8080 port straight from the README, um, and then uh, I have a few little uh, example queries uh, taken from the examples on the website. So this is uh, Java. Going to create a store for um, just a demo store, uh, and here we go. So. Nothing too crazy. You create your client, make your request. Uh, we'll get a little response and uh, give it a moment to build. I was I was working on this up to the last minute, of course. Um, I was trying to be fancy and add lots of languages, uh, which adds to the compile time. There you go. Okay, so you can see the the uh, server saw the saw the request over here, and then here's my little printed statement store ID. Um, so I'm going to grab this store ID and put it in my other things real quick. So over here and over here. Um, here's Kotlin, uh, same kind of idea. Uh, create a, you know, I'm creating a client just for demo purposes. I wrote it out long form for everything. Um, here I'm going to create the uh, an auth model. This is the one off of the, also off the like the OpenFGA.dev website. Um, this should run a little faster. So run this one. Um, it'll write the authorization model, get the response, and tell us the ID of the authorization model. And then uh, last little bit, I'll go over to Groovy. Um, and here, I'm going to add just one relationship. So same idea, create my client, um, create the, the write request, and then write it out. Here we go. I didn't have a anything that writes out from here, but it will show up over here on the server log. And that's the idea. And then uh, you know, it's it's a JVM language. I I didn't get it quite as far as getting the Scala bit, uh, but you could do Scala. You could do uh, um, Clojure or Flix or Gosu or whatever kind of weird and wacky language. But the Java and Kotlin 
scholar probably the most the most common ones that people will show up um and yeah uh should be coming soon uh let me know if anybody has questions or comments cool Thank lots of thumbs up <laughs> yeah yeah we're excited so we have a, a a lot of customers that are asking for java is okay for and uh, so it would be great to oh to yeah see live okay so back to my to all my slides <clears throat> so I, I mentioned that we shipped a new, a new version of the CLI. These are the kind of things the, the, this uh, version allows you to do, which is basically create a store directly from an FGA model, write the model directly from an FGA model instead of using the JSON format. If you do FGA model get and the store is already configured in an environment variable, you're going to get the model, the, the latest model from the store, and, the, and then you can transform from and to the JSON format using the model transform thing, right? So all of that is working. You might simplify some of your CI CD processes where you are kind of writing, taking the FGA model from uh, GitHub and then transforming it so to um, and transforming it to JSON before writing it, or just keeping it in JSON GitHub. This one will can just let you use the FGA model directly. And uh, so this is this. So the next thing for the CLI is something we mentioned a couple of times in the previous meetings, which is let you write tests in in the uh, in a YAML format that you can execute from the CLI, and that will kind of uh, simplify uh, testing FGA models. So you wouldn't need to do this from your own unit tests languages, and then you just can call the CLI and write this, will be simpler to write. And then, and we're also thinking of letting you run this without spawning, a, launching a server. So you can actually test FGA models and tuples and scenarios uh, from the CLI directly, right, without even hitting the server. So this is one way of doing it when the model and the test are gonna be in the same file. This is another, way, a similar way where the model is in a different file and you reference it from the tests. And this is another way of you only have the tests and the models are actually in an FGA store that you need to point to whenever to, to run the test. Okay, so we are starting to work on that, on this now. So if you have any ideas or feedback or things you want to achieve, let us know. And the idea is that you'll be able to test checks and these objects or any other APIs. So the results of these API calls from the in this YAML definition file. Okay, and then the other thing we're working on, we mentioned that we have our kind of finalizing our, our design documents and, and, and decisions to how to approach this from a technical perspective, is this uh, uh, option to add more ABAC-like policies. Uh, these are some of the scenarios we're thinking of. This is uh, adding temporal access policies, right? So in this case, I'm granting, uh, access from one hour since this uh, after this moment right and then i can check if a specific time a user has access or not to to that uh, to, to that relationship so here you see the the, the relation is defined with the the in the in the, the condition defining the relationship as part of the the direct relationship assigned so with each time you need to assign a user here it will be with a condition so when you write a tuple for viewer, the tuple will need to have a condition here. Then the, another scenario will be if you want to restrict access based on IP addresses. In this case, we are saying that the, the IP needs to be in a specific range. When you write the tuple, you specify the range and in check, you call the API, use the current user API to decide if the user can perform, perform the action or not. Another common use case. Uh, then the, there's another ones that are kind of more interesting are not as kind of this the time and ap based one are pretty common use cases and the this was i i found them more uh, more unique or interesting which is kind of let's assume you have uh, documents with specific attributes and you want to let some groups of users access uh, 
documents that have specific status, right? So for example, draft or, or in progress or things like that, right? So in this case, you can assign a condition at the org level, which is which are the members that can access, which group members can access docs and specify a condition. And then, and then for the document, you can say they can access a document if they can access from the organization. So whatever permissions are defined at the org level. And then here you can define a tuple that says, okay, there's a document in the, in the Contoso org, a member of the engineering group. And then the members of the engineering group can only allow, view uh, documents that are in the status, in the draft or the published status, right? So here the, the condition is at the group level, but you can evaluate it at the user level when you do a check, right? So I can check if the user can view this document given that the document is in a draft status, right? And given that the user is a member of the engineering group and the members of the engineering group can view documents that are in draft status, then it will return access through. Okay? So this give you, gives you a way more flexibility to define policies that are more based on attributes. And uh, so this is another interesting use case. And then another, another use case is if you want to do entitlements, we have some examples today that let you define entitlements, but it's more about does this plan has this feature and it doesn't let you do things instead of like a, a has this feature or not, it's more, it can use only this feature depending on the usage level, right? So in this case, it's more about can a user invite uh, new members to an FGA store, for example, uh, based on the limit that that subscription has, right? So we want to say that uh, the, the, the pro subscription has a limit of 100, but the free subscription has a level of uh, limit of 10. Okay? And then based when we ask for, uh, for permissions, we can say, can John, can, uh, so here, this is, uh, I wrote it incorrectly, but it will be like, I can, uh, yeah, can, it should be, can invite members to the store, sorry. I, I, Made a mistake with creating an example, but basically, I know, sorry, it's fine. So it's kind of creating a story. Yeah. So we have a, a, up to 100 stores per, per, per customer, right? So John can create a, a, the store number 101 because he's uh, um, actually she to return false. So I'm sorry again, made a mistake here. So if he's asked for 100 and 110, he should return false because the limit is 100. If he asks for 10, he should return true. And then there are other uh, features that don't have a condition. For example, can create a region in, the, in, the, in Europe is a feature that when you write it, there's no condition attached to it because in the has feature, I let you actually write uh, assign to subscribers that don't have a condition and subscriber with a condition, right? So depending on that, the feature can be conditioned to specific usage level or not. And I didn't explain this very well, I'm sorry. And uh, I will do a better job the next time when, with the right examples. And uh, so, but the idea here is that there's a lot of ways that you can use the feature to different set of scenarios. And I think we think this is going to be very valuable. And we're going to start working on this pretty soon. So then we have, and the one that is, so we have a community survey. I'm going to, we are going to share it more broad, broadly, but I'm going to put the link here in the, in the chat. Uh, so it will be awesome if you can answer it and, uh, and give us some feedback about how you're using the product and, and what's coming and, and, and what you wanted to help to see it evolve in the future. I think that's it from the content we had. So um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, that's the moment to ask. Perfect. See you, Pranaya, the next time. Yeah. You already left, so it's not going to hear me. Uh, hi. So, sorry. Um, this is Mohan Willem. Hey, um, Mohan. I already have a question there because no one is asking a question. I was going to exploit this uh, time to ask this question if that's okay. Probably a quick answer. Probably it has been already decided. Um, I'm evaluating OpenFGA for, for one of our use cases. In, in that, I need to 
synchronize the OpenFTA tuples uh, with, uh, for example, Active Directory data. Uh, so um, probably in, so I directly tuples I'm talking about, there might be probably around 30,000 tuples. And now if I want to synchronize this, um, what's the best way to do that? Because currently there is no observed for tuples, uh, as I see in the POC, for example, I am reading all the tuples and doing all the checks I want to do. And then I, and then I see, okay, so I need to just add five tuples and uh, delete 10 tuples. So all the processing happening and then um, and storing it in. But I don't want to read all tuples, obviously. That's not good. So it, 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 it's this kind of bulk update is something considered or to be considered? Um, sorry, so usually in, in when you have a control over the IDP, what you would not do this one time. So you'd have a listener on on your source. So as uh, your data is changing, someone's being deleted, someone's role has changed, you would be listening to those. And as they happen, you'd be deleting and adding tuples depending on what happened on your end. So it's not a one-time thing. It's like, if you can listen to the change log that's being exposed from your uh, from the source and updating FGA with it. Yeah, that, that would make, yeah, that would make perfect sense. So uh, yeah, we have some operational restriction on that actually. Um, that's why we had to go down this route, but yeah, okay. That makes sense, yeah. So if, yeah. if we had with that, that would be great. Yeah. Be, but yeah, but I, I, I like to kind of follow up with, with you on this one because that's an important scenario, okay? How you we, we, we let you integrate data from, from, from AD data queries, right? So if you're having any issue with following the approach that Raghav had mentioned, let, let's, let's follow up on that offline and try to understand, okay, how we can help you in that scenario because I think it's an important scenario for us to, to consider, right? The, uh, Right now, as you mentioned, I've seen your question in GitHub. I was going to reply to it, but the the, the uh, on on so there are two two things. One is having potentially more flexibility on the read API, so you can read uh, more specific things instead of reading everything. Right? That's something. There's some flexibility you have. I don't know for the question you asked. Maybe you can do it. Maybe not. I I need. To, I was asking a follow up question to clarify clarify that. And then, and the their approach for 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 writes and uh, is, I think, like a, it, it, when you when you send a batch write, and the batch write is kind of it will, and you can send it in a way that is transactional, so all the tuples are going to be written or, or none of them, right? And and there's also a way we offer in the SDKs that is going to write them in like a with a specific write call for each one. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the mm -hmm. case of what happens, you're gonna be able to write all the ones that not, don't exist, right? And get errors for the one that existed, but the ones that, that didn't exist are gonna be written. Okay. So that might be an approach that, that, that can help. However, I think the, the, the one that is uh, more tricky is the delete one, right? So delete one, yeah. you delete tuples from the FCA, how do you know which tuples you need to delete? Uh, because for that. Uh, you basically need to kind of read the, the ones from FGA and check mm -hmm. if they are in Active Directory, right? That's why the approach Ragged Success seems better in the sense that you can handle the delete scenario that way, right? Each time there's mm -hmm. a delete deletion in the direct directory, you can delete it from FGA. Right? Mm -hmm. Because if not, there's no other way than reading all the data from FGA and checking if it's still in the Active Directory, right? And that wouldn't be very practical right? unless, I don't know, they don't change often, right? But. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that, that, that's the other part. I mean, they don't change quite often, but because they are not, uh, I, I don't have the a way to listen. Now I have 30,000, I still don't know how many change. So that's yeah. probably one or two. That's very sad. Thanks for that. Do you have also a way to, uh, to at least query the ones that changed after the specific moment of time, for example, from Active Directory? Um, as of now, and no. Um, okay. Probably Microsoft Graph API provides it, um, but I don't have access to it. I'm fighting for it, but um, yeah, so I have okay. that. 
So you can also um, you can do for some of, sorry, for, for, so if you're using Azure ID also as, as your identity provider, so you're logging on through Azure ID, right? And what you're, you care mostly is about group membership. What, something you can do is instead of writing those tuples in the FGA store, you can use those as contextual tuples when you're making in, in the check calls or in these objects calls, right? So that way you avoid writing it. When you log in, you get the groups and then you send those groups to each request you make to the FGA data, to FGA service, right? Mm -hmm. So that way you avoid the synchronization problem, right? Yeah, that will yeah. depend on how much data and how many relationships you need to synchronize. But if you have those, as you can obtain those as part of the login flow and include them in the call to FGA, that might be a simpler way to address the problem. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, did think about it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, well, that's also in the, in the consideration. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I'll, I'll try that out as well, thanks. All right, yeah. So let's follow up on, on the GitHub issue because I, I, I think we, we, I love to find a solution for this problem because it's a very common problem. And uh, so I, I like to understand if you could solve it or not, I have. Sure, okay, thank you. Thanks to you. Okay, so if there's no further questions, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Gabrielle, we can follow up offline and, and, and see where, where, you're, where, where you're interested in contributing, right? And we can find you a, a good spot there if you want. And, uh, and, uh, and, and for the rest, we'll see each other in a month. Okay, so. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.